Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us uh, for the brief and brilliant career of uh, Basquiat. How'd I do, Jane? Perfect. <laughs> all right. I was really struggling with that earlier. So after a troubled but uh, privileged childhood, John Michael Basquiat, I'm going to get it, uh, burst onto the 1980s art scene with vision and vitality. He was uh, quickly recognized and earned celebrity status and friendships with leading artists like Andy Warhol. Um, but his uh, work often focused on subjects that were personally meaningful to him as a young black man, including race, class, and police violence. So find out how his paintings, peppered with poetry and sometimes inscrutable symbols, still resonate with us today. And so this program is led by art historian Jane O'Neill, who's the owner of Culturally Curious. Jane curates and delivers art appreciation programs to audiences throughout New England. She holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. Born and raised in New Hampshire, Jane has worked at some of her state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Curier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. And we again thank the uh, Tewksbury Cultural Council and the Friends of the Library for sponsoring. So all uh, nearly 100 of us who are here live and the hundreds more that will watch on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jane for joining us here this morning. And Jane, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about Basquiat. This is the debut of this program, so you're you're kind of my guinea pigs this morning um, in terms of, of the timing and the delivery of the program, but I really appreciate um, you spending your time with me. So we are in for such a treat. Um, Basquiat is still fairly new to me, and so I'd like to give credit to uh, Lisa Clark, who uh, certainly helped with research and, and some of the scholarship for today's program. So when it comes to Jean-Michel Basquiat, we are dealing with an artist who had a very short career, really less than a decade, but during that time he was more prolific than Van Gogh. His paintings, as we'll see, are layered and dense with meanings, uh, meaning and references and symbols. He was really an exceptional figure in the art world, not just for exuberant work like the trumpet that we see over here on the right, but for the fact that he was a young Black man in a very white elitist field. So um, what we'll see is that he painted uh, pictures about the Black experience, and they were highly unusual for the art world at the time. We're going to unpack as much of this as we can over the next hour. But before um, we, we sort of unveil <laughs> how we'll spend this hour together, I, I wanted to start with the big spoiler, of course. I think most people are familiar with Basquiat because of the record price this work fetched at auction back in 2017, this untitled work um, that, that was painted in the early 1980s uh, uh, got a more than $110 million at auction. And that, that broke a record in terms of the highest price ever paid for an American painting. Uh, since then, the record has been broken by Basquiat's friend, Andy Warhol. But it's a challenging work. Um, as you look at it, I want you to just sort of rest your eyes on it for a minute and consider what you like about it, what you find appealing, what you find maybe challenging or perplexing here. I, there's so much to unpack when it comes to Basquiat, but I'm going to help you along the way. So let me give you a sense in terms of how we are spending this next hour together. Here's our program overview. We're going to start off with an introduction to the artist, focus on how he launches himself with street art and personal symbols. Then we'll turn our attention to the fact that he was also a musician and how um, uh, hip hop and sampling music sort of influenced his approach to art making. We'll look at his celebrity friendships and some of those collaborations, finish up with his uh, identity as a Black man in the art world, as well as his death and his legacy. This is um, 
just such an endearing picture here. It's called Pez Dispenser from 1984. How can you not love a crowned Tyrannosaurus Rex? Okay, so let's get started with an introduction to Jean-Michel Basquiat. Here are some really adorable childhood pictures here. He was born in 1960 in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and he was born into a solidly middle-class family. He was a precocious child, and he learned to read and write by the time he was just four years old. Here he is in photographs with his parents. His father on the left was born in Haiti. His mother on the right was born to Puerto Rican parents. So by the time he was 11, Jean-Michel Basquiat was fluent in three languages, uh, Creole, French, uh, English, and of course, Spanish. His father recounted that at an early age, his young son was, was thinking about uh, really kind of high level ideas. When he was just six, he said, Papa, do you know about energy? There's energy all around us. When I move my hand, I create energy. There's energy everywhere, Papa. So he was incredibly bright and his mother played a huge role in um, in terms of focusing his, his um, uh, intellect and his, his drive towards the arts. She made sure he was enrolled in private education. She also helped him attain a junior membership to the Brooklyn Museum of Art. In fact, she took him to museums all the time. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum, or uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, the Museum of, of Modern Art as well. And when they would do these visits, they would always go home and sketch together. As a child, he was always drawing. Now, something uh, sort of tragic happens to him at a very young age. At the age of, of seven, he was out in the street playing basketball, and he got hit by a car. He had a long recovery. He was in the hospital for about a month and ended up losing his spleen. Uh, to help him pass the time, his mother actually bought him a copy of Grey's Anatomy, and he internalized this book. He was fascinated by this book. Um, some art historians even say that he memorized this book. I think that's probably a stretch, but we do know that those anatomical drawings influenced his artwork for the rest of his life. We see um, we see an interest in skulls, in, in vessels, in, in bones uh, creeping into his pictures. He actually does a whole series on anatomical pictures. This is uh, just a, a peek at one of them, and you can see that the composition really echoes the cover of the book. So that car crash, that car accident that he was involved in, being hit by a car, as you can imagine, was, was really traumatic, and it finds its way into so many of his paintings. This is a really early work, but we can see uh, references to cars, to an ambulance. We can also see things like a hammer and nails and a cannon and cannonballs over here. Um, so we get the, the idea of, of something that's loud, something that has a terrific impact, and with the repetition of the letter A, we can also get a sense of, of kind of the wail of, of the siren of an ambulance. So he plays up that, um, that traumatic incident, especially early on in his career. This is one of his, his uh, uh, very early paintings. So as a young man, um, this kind of privileged upbringing that he has shifts. His mother is, um, is, is largely absent because she was struggling with mental health and frequently had to be institutionalized. His father was, um, had, had expectations of him leading a more traditional life, and apparently there was a lot of conflict between them. Basquiat began to run away. Every few weeks, his father would go out and find him living in Washington Square Park or something like that and bring him home. But at the age of 17, he, he left home for good, and he went to live in lower Manhattan. He was basically crashing with friends um, and sometimes even living on the streets. But at a young age, even at the age of 17, he was ambitious and he believed that he was destined for success. So um, one of the ways he uh, starts to find that, or at least explore it, is through graffiti or what most people call street art at this point, especially when we're thinking about uh, Basquiat. He um, 
he used brick walls as his canvas, spray, spray paint cans were his brushes. From the beginning, he was really smart about marketing himself as a street artist. He essentially branded himself in, in these tags, and he would tag locations that were um, really kind of prime spots to get noticed. He was strategic about where he would put these graffiti tags. We're going to get back to this in just a moment, but it's an important part of this trajectory that I wanted to, to um, infuse at this point. Now, um, he makes this shift to from the spray paint cans to paint brushes. And in those first few years, at the end of the 1970s, going into the 1980s, he is still living at the edge of poverty, but he, he really can't stop making art. He is compulsive in his art making. He would live in, in uh, with girlfriends in sort of like semi-abandoned buildings in lower Manhattan. And they would find, these girlfriends would find him painting constantly. 4 a.m. He just couldn't stop. And he, because he was still poor, he didn't have um, traditional materials. So he would paint on any surface he could find. We see over here the refrigerator. And of course, this is a television that he painted on over here on the right. Apparently, he had a real thing about TVs. He would keep TVs on all the time. He would have records blaring, and he would keep um, novels and textbooks open on the floor as he was as he was painting. He was internalizing all of these reference points. It's sort of like the modern day equivalent to somebody having 50 tabs open on their web browser. Um, he was doing this all really before the digital age too. So when it comes to his work, sometimes it almost feels like a, te a test because all of, all of his paintings are really kind of encrypted with these different references. And it's like, do you understand the references? Are you looking hard enough? So um, continuing on with his his trajectory as an artist. In addition to painting televisions, he started painting t-shirts and sweatshirts and little postcards and he was selling them out in out in the park to to make a buck and then basically buy more t-shirts and, and postcards in order to sell. These are just a few of the examples that he was making in those early years. But what's really kind of remarkable is that Basquiat went from being uh, broke <laughs> to and having absolutely no formal training as an artist to be from being homeless to becoming a millionaire at the age of 21. Uh, the same year that he sold his first painting for $200, he began selling paintings paintings for $20,000, and he couldn't keep up with the demand. His first solo show earned him $200,000. So on uh, the far right here, we can see him painting in an, uh, an $800 Armani, Armani suit. Remember, this is like the age of the yuppie. He would paint in these suits just to ruin them. He understood intuitively that his art was more, uh, more than just the paintings. It was about him and how he lived and how he presented himself. He took on this idea of life being an art project um, throughout his, his career, um, right up to his premature death. And he is still regarded as a genius today, a barrier breaker, and someone who was sort of artfully disheveled all the time. He's like a style icon even today. I'm sort of emulating it in my outfit. So um, let's get started looking at his work as a street artist and getting familiar with his personal symbols. Okay. So uh, even early on, we're going to see a lot of big ideas taking root for him. In the late 1970s, Basquiat uh, was going to a school for, for gifted teens that basically uh, weren't successful in traditional classrooms. This was called City as a School. And it was there that he met his friend Al Diaz, who we see him sitting with over here. And they became... Uh, close friends, artistic collaborators. They were two guys who were up to no good a lot of the time. And they created this fictional character uh, called Samo. And we can see that tag over here with the copyright symbol. Samo was... Um, was was kind of shorthand for saying same old shit. <laughs> and so it became this kind of inside joke for them. And they would uh, use graffiti and this tagline of theirs, this uh, this logo, this brand that they created all around lower Manhattan. They, they would uh, spray paint these kind of enigmatic sort of cryptic messages in, like I said, strategic places. So same with the copyright symbol as a conglomerate of dormant genius or same the so 
so-called avant-garde. You can imagine if you were living in Lower Manhattan at the time, you'd be sort of curious about what Samo was all about. But Samo seemed, I mean, certainly wise beyond the years of the teenagers that were using this name. Samo, as the end to the nine to five, went to college, not to Night Honey Blues. Samo for you. And so it was... Um, it was not too long after SAMO was launched that that Basquiat essentially reveals to um, to the media who that he was SAMO. He and his friend part ways, and and SAMO is dead. He's ready to really launch himself as as a professional artist, and this was a great way to do so with a, a lot of kind of no, notoriety behind him. So um, so let's let's see how how he sort of backs away from from the graffiti and how he puts these these uh these words onto onto paper so uh we can see a, an early work where we see that sort of familiar looking text it's the the large capital letters it almost looks uh like childlike script in some ways and it says it says here death is roll aids fast relief Popeye died of syphilis eating cheeseburgers on color TV in front of his mother it's like a love-hate relationship with Walt Disney and that's repeated again down here it's um it's cut up it's taped to this grid paper there's this kind of expressionist mark making here it's as though the graffiti has come down off the wall and onto the page it's hard to know is this poetry is this commentary is it some other joke that we're just not getting well Basquiat had a great mind and he was really interested in poetry and language. He was actually friends with beat poets. Um, this is him with William Burroughs at Allen Ginsberg's house and even the other artists that he chose to have close friends with, including Keith Haring over here, were kind of interested in in. Um, language as text in in a similar way. Keith Haring is always kind of credited for creating this uh, sort of modern hieroglyph in, in these recognizable figures here. So Basquiat really understood the great power of words and symbols. And when he makes his full transition um, to the world of fine art, we can see that he's bringing this kind of graffiti background to the, the museum wall to the gallery wall. So this is a 1982 painting called Multi Flavors, and it demonstrates the way that Basquiat used writing for visual effect. He once said, there's about 30 words around you all the time. And he used the example of like thread or exit. These words are just sort of um, in, the, in the ether. And so he was, you know, the person who's kind of constantly inhaling all of these references and integrating it into his work. So with this all caps uh, street art text, you can see all of these loose associations, uh, things that he was being exposed to coming into his artwork. And it sort of looks like an ad, right? hacked chicken with multi flavors over here. We notice that some of the text is um is crossed out some of it is emphasized. He knew from art history that when you cross out text people are um much more interested in trying to decipher it. So we'll see throughout his career that he is crossing things out, that he's painting over them, but leaving a, a, a little bit of a, a pentimento there so that you could see through the paint and, and try to decipher the text that's there. Uh, we see also th this crown shape that he becomes well associated with and some circles here. So with just, um, with just a little design work and a, a, a lot of emphasis on text and, and composition, we get something that is really sort of mystifying, really kind of intriguing, but all of these bold colors really just draw you in. You can't definitively see whether it's satire or it's poetry, um, whether it's exuberant or whether it's funny. It could be all of those things at the same time. But let's circle back to that crown right at the center of this picture. Um, this leads us to Basquiat's most recognizable symbol. He's, he's, um, He's already discarded the name Samo. The crown becomes Basquiat. Um, 
he adopts this essentially as his logo, as, as, his, as his new tag, and it essentially functions as his signature. The crown is such a fascinating signature to adopt. It's a universal symbol. It's easy for all of us to understand whether you're young, old, rich, or poor. We all have a, a, a clear idea and rich associations with what a crown is. So it has this kind of mass appeal and recognition, and it served Basquiat really well and helped to raise up his stature in the art world. Before he himself became an icon, Basquiat was painting them. He was painting figures from um, from, from uh, African-American life uh, and, and crowning them. He was crowning musicians and athletes as, uh, as kings by, um, by writing their names and, and uh, assigning this crown to them. And then like them, he himself becomes coronated. So, um, so it, here is an early work and a photograph of the artist with this work where we can see he's probably associating uh, what many believe to be a self-portrait with with the crown here. This is called Minor Success from 1982. I, I love uh, the smile on his face over here. We can see the graffiti artist sort of pared down repertoire and a lot of familiar elements here. The repetition of the letter A, he loves the letter A, the crown, obviously, the car as well. And so we can see that there are motifs that get played up and, and become really familiar. Uh, and um, it, um, Sort of, sort of help us make sense out of who he is early on. All right, so when it comes to the crown and the letter A, I, I mentioned before that he was coronating figures from African-American life. And sometimes he just did that with something as simple as a name here. So in this case, uh, we have, uh, this is probably a reference to Hank Aaron, who was one of his favorite ball players. I love that he adds the copyright logo here again, just like with his graffiti tag, we get the sense that he's sort Sort of playing with and knowledgeable and maybe even poking fun at um at the marketing of visual imagery but all he needs is the name here and the crown um i also love the photo here where he's he's painted that that same motif on a helmet and has crowned himself similarly i think it's important for us too to keep in mind that by the early 80s, this notion of crowning or coronating people from Black American life was still pretty foreign to us as, as, um, as a culture. And, um, and these days, we're more familiar with Black artists elevating um, regular people and, and, um, and important people alike in, uh, in our visual culture. You have artists like Kehinde Wiley who do that by referencing the history of art. But Basquiat was really the first person to, to say, you know, look at this person from Black life in America. I'm going to put a crown on them because they're that significant to me. Um, and so it, it, he was he was really kind of a barrier breaker in that way. Now, what we're going to do now is shift gears and think about Basquiat as a musician and see how that influenced him in terms of his visuals. Basquiat um, was actually in a band. He named the band Grey, which was a reference to Grey's Anatomy once again. That book really sort of stays with him throughout his life, um, as well as the traumatic experience of being hit by a car. Now, the band Grey played at a number of very hip venues in downtown New York, um, including, I, I think, the Mud Club and, and, and several others. Actually, one of the clubs was simply named A. It was on Broom Street. So it's another connection back to that visual um, text element that he loves so much. But what's interesting about his band is that none of these people had any experience playing the instruments that they were playing. So some art historians refer to this as like machine rock, Others call it kind of noise rock. It's essentially a lot of improvisation. And I don't imagine that it sounded amazing. <laughs> but, um, but what we see how this kind of translates to his work visually is that we see an artist who is really interested and um, very fond of, very, feels very connected to the great uh, jazz uh, musicians that, that came before him. He has a tremendous respect for that kind of improvisation. So we go back to trumpet that we started with over here. We can see that he's using text and actually sort of defacing the text along the way to make it a little bit inscrutable. But we get the sense that the text in this case is pointing to the sound that this trumpet is, is, um, is creating. We 
also notice that this trumpet player has a black face and a black crown. Um, sometimes these crowns are even thought to be sort of an extension of or a symbol of the intellect of, uh, of the person that, that is being coronated. And I think in this case, to unify them in terms of the color really does um, kind of speak to what's happening cerebrally for, for somebody who is, is making music this way. Over on the left, we have a work called Saxophone. We'll see with Basquiat, he oftentimes does uh, misspell things seemingly on purpose. This is a work that is rich in text. There's a lot to decode here and it doesn't all make sense. We could spend a full hour looking at it, but we do have our saxophone right here and a number of, of black bodies, fragmented bla uh, black bodies who are associated with its playing here. So both of these works can really be understood as an expression of the artist's love for jazz. And he goes back to um, this, this subject, this topic, again and again throughout his career. I think that this is one of his most successful works on this topic. This is called Horn Players from 1983. We see the celebration of more musicians, specific musicians in this case. We've got Charlie Parker and um, Dizzy Gillespie. And the word ornithology again and again and again, which of course is a nod to Charlie Parker's uh, legendary jazz standard ornithology from 1946. So this work really shows this relationship between the improvisational style of painting and the alchemy, we see this word repeated over here, of jazz composition. In both of these art forms, we have the underlying structure of, of rhythm, um, but in the case of Basquiat, we have these frenetic um, brush strokes here and it sort of floats and, and skitters around a lot like the melody in, in jazz. Um, when it comes to alchemy, we, we sort of get the sense that there is a magical process that happens, whether you're making music, jazz music, or whether you're making a painting like this. I also want to point out that this painting is divided into threes. It's actually a triptych form, which goes back hundreds of years, um, but tri triptychs are, are um, traditionally religious paintings, like you see in this work from about 1500. So he is, um, he's not giving these, these musicians crowns per se, but he is revering them as though they are divine. And he's doing this in such a smart way. He's referencing the history of art. This is definitely a person that knows his art history. So in addition to making music in his noise rock band, uh, Basquiat also uh, served as a DJ. We can see him over here on the left uh, spinning at the Mud Club. And he was known to be um, uh, a really, dis I guess he had a very distinctive style of dance. He kind of uh, marched to his own drummer. Uh, one of his friends said he looked like a Bowery bum and a fashion model all at the same time. So I think there's a lot of charisma loaded into what he was doing every step along the way. In addition to DJing and dancing, he actually also tried his hand at producing music. He produced a, a hip hop record that was called Beat Bop. You can see that text um, repeated in this work here. It was, it was, believe it or not, a 10 minute long track. Um, there were only 500 copies of it created apparently it's like the holy grail of of hip-hop history uh it and uh and and not surprisingly he created the cover uh, um album art for that that song and um and the the music and the cover art are so highly collectible today but we can see all of the familiar elements here we see the text we see the crown we see references to anatomy here we see um text being obfuscated as well, references to collisions or bangs or booms. Uh, his, his, uh, he's able to, to take these familiar elements and, and represent them in fascinating ways too. I, I spent a lot of time staring at this particular image and I might even posit that, that perhaps there's a little bit of a suggestion of, of a skeleton head in, in, in the formation of, of this composition too. So, um, Hip hop as an art form introduced the concept of sampling to Basquiat, this idea of taking a little piece of somebody else's work, combining it with some new elements and presenting it as your own new work. Now, this is something that's been happening in music and in art since 
you know, since <laughs> the beginning of time. As, as a friend of mine says, there are no new ideas. But this idea of sampling creeps into um, the way Basquiat creates art as well. So with this work here, it's called uh, Boone from 1983. This is a portrait of, uh, of his art dealer at the time. And we can, of course, see that he's uh, referencing, he's sampling a little bit of Leonardo da Vinci and the Mona Lisa here. He might even be referencing or sampling um, Duchamp's send-up of the Mona Lisa, uh, which is a kind of a, a famous graffitied version with a, a joke about the Mona Lisa's butt <laughs> down here at the bottom. So he updates that text and he puts in the name of his art dealer and, and sort of adds his own graffiti to the face of, of the famous Mona Lisa. Now, I think what's sort of interesting here is uh, perhaps the way Basquiat feels so connected to the original artist, to Leonardo da Vinci in this case. I'm just going to zoom in on that letter B. Notice that he emphasizes that downward stroke and the sideways stroke here. It's in red. It's perhaps a reference to Leonardo. And then he does the B on top of it, essentially combining um, uh, the first letter of his own name and the first letter of Leonardo's name there together. Um, that that would be something that that um, somebody might do in a hip hop song. It makes sense that he's doing it, it visually as well. So art historians um, can easily see how he's sampling and referencing other artists throughout his career. We already know he loves Leonardo da Vinci. We're going to see a little bit later too how he samples his work in other ways. But da Vinci's notebooks were filled with these diagrams and these ideas. And you can see in some of Basquiat's work, including King, King Alfonso over here, similar kind of compositions, uh, uh, the, the sense that he is mapping something out in, in his work here. He's also connected visually to artists like uh, Willem de Kooning, whose work we see over here on the left. This is Woman Number no. One from 1952, where we see these uh, bright colors, these almost wild brushstrokes and references to the figure. And I think you can see something similar in Basquiat's work over here on the right. Uh, that's why, for example, he's called, uh, he's generally known as or referred to as being a neo-expressionist. He's basically updating what, Bas what uh, artists like de Kooning had been doing a couple of decades earlier. Basquiat uh, was a self-professed fan of Cy Twombly. We can see an example of Twombly's work over here, which gives us these kind of frenetic scribbles, this emphasis on text. If we compare it to a Basquiat on the right, we see that, that he is... Um, He's borrowing the same ideas. This is another homage to uh, Charlie Parker and uh, in particular, the, the, the date and the place where he died. It sort of functions as its own little tombstone over here in two dimensions. One other artist that, that Basquiat is oftentimes connected to as well is Robert Rauschenberg. And I have two, well, one example of Rauschenberg's work over here. It is also uh, expressionistic in uh, the application of paint, but we can also see, especially in the detail, that, uh, that he integrates collage into his paintings as well. And Basquiat was known to integrate a lot of collage elements into certain works. This is a painting called Glen from 1984. It's actually over nine feet tall. We have this painted element, this kind of fascinating skull here with the checkerboard teeth and the piano up here in the brain. But we can see pages upon pages of, of, of um, collage integrated into to the background. And these are all kind of other skulls created by Basquiat. Um, so he's he's thinking about all of these artists that came before him, some of him, some of them hundreds of years earlier, some of them just a couple of decades earlier. And he's um, very thoughtfully and um and carefully kind of adapting their their methods to his to his own art making. I also want to, since we're looking at this particular image, draw your attention to the quality of Basquiat's line. Really, nobody created lines like this. They, it's, they are unique unto him. One art historian said his lines shiver like someone naked in a snowstorm. That just sort of stayed with me. There's this kind of energy and vitality to them. So we'll wrap up this, I, this idea of music and sampling um, with 
with a couple of examples of these skull or head pictures that um, that I think really kind of bring all of these elements together that we've been talking about. The, the, um, the application of paint, the bright colors, these shivering lines, once again, these works are in high demand today. People really love them. And of course, when we're talking about skulls, even though these seem uh, sort of strikingly modern as we look at them, and sometimes even a little bit hard to look at, I will admit too, but the more time you spend with them, the, the more fun they are to, to decode. But I, I just remind you that skulls are kind of a, a another age old uh, motif, an age old trope in the history of art going back hundreds of years. Skulls have always been references to mortality, whether the painting is realistic or whether it's a, a silk screen by artists like Andy Warhol. And these are a couple of skulls created by Warhol in the 1970s. So that is the perfect segue for us to switch gears and start thinking about Basquiat, his celebrity friendships, and some of the collaborations that came out of that. So, um, so to begin, we have Basquiat and uh, uh, an important relationship that he had early on was with the hip hop pioneer, uh, Fab Five Freddy, who we see over here. He was a fellow DJ and also um, a, an incredibly influential figure in terms of street art. We also see Basquiat with Keith Haring, who um, also got his start as a street artist. And that was a relationship that was sustained as both of them uh, broke into the world of fine art as well. In fact, every now and then, Keith Haring and Basquiat would collaborate on a work of art. And you can almost think of them as like a visual conversation happening between the two of them. This is an untitled work from 1980. So it was really before either one of them broke out onto the scene. We can see uh, Keith Haring's real distinctive uh, dance figures and you see how confident every one of his lines are. You can really um, distinguish every component of this work that, that he contributed to it. Contrast that with this kind of shaky, shivering line of Basquiat and you, you can uh, quickly tell what parts of this work he contributed to. We've got the crown, we've got the text here as well. I would, uh, we, we also have other text that he is, is trying to obscure. And I would I would bet that he probably uh, altered this this figure by Keith Haring to to create a black figure here as well. So it's really interesting to see all of these familiar elements already kind of coming together as early as the 1980s. Basquiat uh, had al also had a friendship or a relationship with Debbie Harry of Blondie. They actually appeared together in a movie that was loosely inspired by the life and the work of Basquiat. It was called New York Beat. Um, it sort of stalled in production and then was re-released uh, probably a decade or so later as a movie called Downtown 81. But um, even as they were shooting the movie, Basquiat was poor. He couldn't, he, he was still a street artist. He couldn't afford traditional art supplies. And so the crew on the movie actually bought him canvas, bought him paint. And Debbie Harry bought one of those first paintings that he created. She paid just $200 for it. It's this picture right here called Cadillac Moon. All these familiar elements. We've got the automobiles referencing that car accident that uh, the car that hit him when he was just a child, the letter A repeated again and again. And what a, what a hugely important transitional piece. We can see that he's actually crossed out the name Samo over here and put his own name over on the bottom right. Incidentally, uh, Blondie, uh, Debbie Harry invited uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat to appear in one of her videos. It was for the song Rapture, which is considered to be the first rap song to hit number one on the charts in America. And here he is playing a DJ just for a moment or two in that video. So his celebrity connections just go on and on. Bear with me. He actually dated Madonna for a little while. He dated Madonna kind of before she was uh, Madonna. It was before she had any sort of big hits, but she was in the process of recording her first album. And it seems as though they had a pretty passionate relationship. Uh, and her recounting 
of this relationship gives us a lot of insight into his process, how he worked. I love both of these photographs of them uh, because they're just kind of surrounded by graffiti over here on the left and then one of his uh, car accident paintings uh, behind them on the right. She said she would get up in the middle of the night and he would be painting four o'clock in the morning, um, almost as though he was in a trance. And she said, I was blown away by that. She was very, very much moved by his work ethic. She said he was an amazing man and deeply talented. I loved him, but she said he wouldn't stop doing heroin. So early on in his career, he was um, already doing some drugs and we'll find that it becomes a much bigger problem for him down the road. She said, apparently when I broke up with him, or she said, when I broke up with him, he made me give the paintings back to him. Everything that he had made for her, she had to give back and he painted them black. He admitted that um, occasionally when he got mad at a woman, he would do a great awful painting of her. So here is maybe one of the paintings that he made for Madonna and maybe painted black. We can see that he's crossed out her name here and added in the word Venus, which was a reference to or sort of a pet name that he had for his next girlfriend after that. And over here on the right is Madonna standing in an art museum in 2017 with that breakup painting <laughs> right behind her there. Uh, the uh, the celebrity connections go on and on, but the most important celebrity relationship that Basquiat had was with Andy Warhol, and they have kind of an interesting meet cute story. Uh, I, I think Andy Warhol was sort of uh, aware of who Basquiat was from um, from early on, maybe even uh, as early as when Basquiat was was uh, still a street artist. But Basquiat approached Andy Warhol while he was uh, eating lunch one day with, with a friend, and he sold him a postcard for $1. This is the postcard, and it says, stupid games, bad ideas. And a couple of years later, they, it, um, uh, once Basquiat's star was really on the rise, Warhol was always interested in, um, in friends with celebrities. They, it was arranged for the two of them to have lunch. And Andy Warhol took a Polaroid of the two of them together at that lunch gave it to Basquiat, who immediately went home and created this painting um, based on that Polaroid. He had it immediately sent to Warhol. Warhol received it just two hours after the lunch. And, and you know, years later, as he's reflecting on that, he says it probably, you know, with traffic, it probably would have taken him an hour to get this, this still wet painting to me. So he probably created this, I, what I think is just a great portrait of Andy Warhol. He probably created this in about the space of an hour. So it was really from there that this kind of beautiful artistic friendship emerges. Of course, Andy Warhol does a silk screen portrait of Jean-Michel Basquiat. Incidentally, um, this, this uh, portrait sold for $34 million. Who would want a little piece of both of them in a work like this? And uh, Warhol really takes Basquiat under his wing in a lot of ways. Well, I should say there were a lot of people that were a little bit cynical about this relationship, sort of doubted that the two of them were really friends. What, what did they really have in common at this point in their lives? Um, but it was a symbiotic relationship. Uh, Warhol was always looking for somebody who was young and interesting and successful. It helped him stay relevant. And Basquiat was... Uh, certainly could use somebody who was in the art establishment to help him make introductions, to help him open doors. We know that Andy Warhol gave him space, gave him a, a place to live and work on Great Jones Street by 1983. Incidentally, um, that space is available for rent right now, and it could goes for about $60,000 a month. But uh, Basquiat lived there for the last five years of his life. So Warhol played an important role of support in his life. And a couple of years after they met, the two artists started collaborating. And um, and, and I think this really shows that, that, that they weren't necessarily just in it to promote themselves. They, they really had fun working together. Uh, Andy Warhol would give these, these wonderful interviews where he said, you know, I would lay down a, a familiar logo. We can see him painting the word Ford over here. They did a whole series on, on GE. And he said Basquiat would just immediately go in and start defacing it. And he said he'd paint me out of every picture we did together. Their mutual friend Keith Herring said the collaborations were seemingly effortless. Uh, it was a physical conversation happening in paint instead 
side of words. So some of their first work was uh, very well regarded. I love this kind of professional stance that they have with their arms crossed in the galleries here. We can see uh, that GE logo looming large, but apparently Basquiat was responding to that GE logo with his concerns about you know, the energy crisis. So he was um, defacing that logo with things like uh, um, single cell batteries and um, and skulls, of, of course. And so it just reminds us all too that Basquiat was thinking about energy and, um, and uh, how energy is all around us way back when he was six years old. He was such a precocious kid. Now, the two artists continued to collaborate uh, with varying degrees of success. <laughs> In 1985, they had uh, a, um, an exhibition of their collaboration with these now famous boxing pictures as publicity. But this show was critically panned. And actually, the New York Times referred to Basquiat as being Warhol's mascot. And that hit hard, <laughs> forgive the visual pun. Um, Basquiat was, uh, was very hurt by that particular criticism. And he began to distance himself from, from Warhol with whom he had been very close. The two of them used to talk on the phone every day. So uh, Warhol wrote at the time in, in his diary, Jean-Michel hasn't called me in a month, so I guess it's really over. This was an incredibly unfortunate for both of them because by all accounts, Warhol uh, sort of thought of himself as like Basquiat's second father. And he was one of the only people in the young artist's life who could help him rein in his drug use. So when that relationship was severed, it did not, um, Basquiat did not fare well. Now, one lasting impact that uh, Andy Warhol apparently had in Basquiat's life and work was the, um, was the, the, the formation of that crown logo. You can see in some early iterations, Basquiat was using uh, varying, uh, a various number of points in, in uh, the configuration of his crown. Ultimately, he lands on the three-point crown. It makes for such a great, clean logo. And that's something that Warhol would have really respected, right? But art historians point to the fact that it also creates a W, which is perhaps a reference to, to Andy Warhol here as well. Um, forever changes the way you look at that crown. So we're going to briefly touch on the artist, his identity as, as, a, as a Black artist, and then wrap up with his legacy. Now, uh, I think for Jean-Michel Basquiat, it was such a fine line to tell. He said, I'm not a Black artist, I am an artist. But of course, his Blackness was something he could not escape. This is him with a giant group of artists. You can recognize Warhol back here and, and his friend Keith Haring. And, uh, you know, you look at a picture like this and, and you see that the art world is pretty much lily white <laughs> and Basquiat was the exception there. So, so many of his paintings are infused with this awareness of race and probably a commentary on racism itself. Now, he was always interested in boxing. Um, it's it's believed that a lot of his, his images of boxers are probably references to, to Muhammad Ali, but with a picture like this called World Crown from 1981, um, it makes you wonder if this is really more about a picture about race relationships in America, or perhaps even a self-portrait of the artist who's desperately trying to uh, prove himself in, in a white a sort of environment in a white arena that is that is the art world. Notice how desperately he is working to get that punch in. But I, both of these figures are are crowned, and both of them have these sort of awful grimaces on on their faces. So it could be a picture about his life. It could be just an emblematic stand-in for the struggle of of black people in a white dominated society. Now for Basquiat, he ran into racism all the time in spite of and sometimes because of his color. No one expected to see a rich young black man with dreadlocks, especially in the early 80s. He got held up at airports. He, he would have a successful opening and then he couldn't hail a cab. So he expressed the, the sort of the plight of the African-American male of, of African-Americans in general in his paintings. He said, the black person is the protagonist in most of my paintings. I realized that I didn't see many paintings with black people in them. And it should be noted that 
museums and galleries didn't quite know what to do with these works because they didn't fit into any of the stories that they were already telling. These stories weren't being told. So we can see over here on the left, a, a work called Slave Ship that references um, past atrocities against African-Americans. The work over here on the right called um, Light Blue Movers from 1984 or 83, I should say, uh, uh, references you know, present day inequalities where we have two black figures who are moving the furniture, doing this heavy lifting for presumably wealthy white people. Now you can see that there's there's the huffing and puffing that's happening over here, as well as, um, as what almost looks to be like a, a funny way to signify swearing here. There's text down below that is actually uh, from Basquiat's days as, as a street artist uh, that reference the livery line. And uh, what a what a great word to use there because it sort of efficiently suggests, um, you know, uh, feudal lords. And, and, and of course, when we say uh, that, that this big money crushed all these feet, we can see that happening with these movers over here on the right with these big flat feet uh, underneath the weight of, of that heavy chair. But Basquiat's probably best known work that references um, race is called The Death of Michael Stewart from 1983. And this was created in reaction to the death of a 25 year old black graffiti artist who was caught and arrested by the police and then beaten and most likely strangled. He died from his injuries. The officers were charged with criminally negligent homicide but an all white jury um, found them not guilty. So you can imagine that there was quite a sense of outrage. Uh, I mean, we, we've all lived through at this point, um, similar stories in, in recent years. This was um, originally just a, a, a painting that he created in response to this injustice on the wall of Keith Haring's apartment. He shows us the faces of those policemen, but he makes Michael Stewart this anonymous figure, he doesn't give him a face. And, and it sort of suggests that, that, that he, it could be anyone. It could have been him. Um, we should all feel sort of threatened by the fact that, that people have this kind of power and this kind of impunity. He's used the word here, um, defacement. He spelled it out in Spanish with, with the question marks sort of suggesting what has truly been defaced here? Is it you know the criminal justice system? Is it this person's life? Or, or does you know the wall of the subway uh, uh, really matter so much? He circles back to the subject of police and police brutality several times. This is a, another work in this short cycle on this on the subject of Michael Stewart's death. It's called the Irony of a Negro Policeman, um, and and here we can see that he has, he's sort of making this this black police officer a, a little bit of a of a stooge. He's got these um, these kind of monstrous proportions, the skull-like face, this heavy hat here. We've got the word irony and pawn uh, that are are very clear. And this is a picture that I think he 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 made effort to make as clear as possible. He is um, trying to be very intentional with the with the message that he's creating about uh, about black police officers in particular. So uh, we'll we'll end this sort of brief look at at Basquiat and and his relationship to uh, to race and 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 how it, it uh, is represented in his artwork uh, by just considering how the media treated Basquiat. Uh, he his own story was sort of spun into this racist trope by by much of the media. In fact, you oftentimes hear the term "noble savage" as as we look back and consider how he how his story was told. Uh, he was oftentimes represented as sort of an uneducated graffiti artist um, who came from the ghettos, and and oftentimes, uh, which of course is not the case, <laughs> and oftentimes uh, when his life is being sort of assessed, one of the first things that's made clear is that he died from drugs and and his and his intellect and his artistic output is sort of secondary it's it's how he fits into this kind of racist stereotype that that came to the fore uh, Basquiat himself complained that critics had an image of him as a quote 
wild man running around a wild monkey man. So here he is um, famously on the cover of the New York Times Magazine in 1985, um, barefoot and suited. And, um, and, and you sort of wonder what the bare feet in this case were, um, were, were intended for, who made that choice and, and sort of how, how it might fall in, in line with, with some of the ways he was presented to the world um, in, 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 with coded racist language. So let's wrap up with Basquiat's death and legacy. Uh, his death certainly comes as a result of the death of Andy Warhol. Warhol died in 1987 from complications due to surgery, and it left Basquiat really distraught. This was such an important person in his life, a father, a mentor. He went into a great depression after, uh, after uh, Warhol's death. And one of, the, one of the last works that he created was called Riding with Death. This was... Uh, made in 1988. It certainly shows that death was on his mind at this point. It's a relatively sparse painting considering sort of the frenetic works that we've already seen. Um, it's devoid of all that bright color that he'd been using for the past seven or eight years. And in this case, we see a black figure who seems to be riding a skeleton. It's a really simple composition, but it's layered with symbolism and meaning. And in this case, it's most likely a reference to one of Leonardo da Vinci's drawings. You can see a similar skeleton with another human figure uh, riding on the back here. Uh, but with, with Basquiat, he's adding in these other layers. He's adding in the, the layer of, of, of race and um, prompts us to sort of think about power and domination. Is this a, a, a self-portrait? It, do, does this mean that he is pondering suicide at this point? Well, he does die of a drug overdose in August of 1988. And we can see here um, his grave, which is in um, uh, Greenwood Cemetery in, in Brooklyn. He had been hoping to get clean and go to a drug addiction program, but he never made it there. His funeral was attended by more than 200 people. He died at the age of 27. Um, so he's, he's sort of unofficially a part of this Forever 27 Club. All of these uh, creative standouts, like mostly musicians, really, it's Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, um, several others who died at the age of 27. Uh, tragically, way too early. Uh, people were so um, moved by his work and his untimely death that now, even now, every year, there are people that go to his grave and come from as far away as France to do this, to clean it off and to kind of refresh it and honor it in a new way. His friends, his collaborators honored his passing as well. This is Keith Haring's testament to his friend. It's called A Pile of Crowns for Basquiat, created the year that his friend died. Of course, Keith Haring would tragically die uh, just two years later at the age of 31. His old um, partner in crime, um, Al Diaz, uh, uh, the co-collaborator for SAMO, uh, 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 created this graffiti in honor of his friend 30 years later on the streets of New York. And it sort of brings us back full circle to that, that untitled picture that we saw at the beginning of today's program. Uh, this notion that, that with his passing, there's been an ever increasing interest in Basquiat's work. Uh, more people wanting to decipher the, the, all of this coded meaning that he created. And that's of course, what leads to this you know, astronomical price at auction. People want to see Herring's work. There are, I believe, 16 exhibits of his paintings worldwide at this very moment. Um, one of them, King Pleasure, I think just closed in Chelsea and it's opening in Los Angeles um, in just a month or so. Unfortunately, there, there aren't a lot of Basquiat's in public museum collections, but nice to know that there's opportunities to see it otherwise. His work has also inspired stage plays, including uh, one called Samo is Dead and another one um, called 
called The Collaborator, starring Paul Bethany and um, Jeremy Pope. I believe this one is going to be made into a movie. There are other documentaries that have been created on the artist's life, if you're interested. Uh, the Radiant Child, Rage to Riches, and a children's book also called The Radiant Child. What I find really interesting is that these days, the rich and powerful are still using Basquiat as uh, for his kind of cool cachet to enhance their own status. So we have the billionaires, Beyonce and Jay-Z, appearing in an ad for Tiffany's back in 2021. And just to add to you know what I <laughs> what is already too impressive, people they have uh, a I think really like a never before seen Basquiat in the background. Uh, Jay-Z incidentally is sort of emulating. Uh, Basquiat with his hairstyle here. He's also a collector of Basquiat's work. Madonna, if you can believe this is Madonna in her 60s now, um, it sometimes poses on Instagram with uh, Basquiat works that are still in her collection. And then that trickles down, all of that sort of celebrity cool trickles down to us, the average person, because we can buy Basquiat t-shirts from Old Navy it's very day. They are on sale on the website for $25 if you want to get a little bit of that Basquiat cool. Everybody wants that crown, right? We all want to be associated with the crown that Basquiat so rightly deserves. So we will end now um, just reflecting on who he was and what he contributed. He was for a short time like a king. He was like King Midas, really. Anything that he touched turned to gold. He was the most successful Black painter ever. Think of what he accomplished just in his 1920s, just in his 20s, I should say. He broke barriers and his work still seems so innovative today. I want to share with you this one quote from um, an art historian who know him. He described Basquiat's work as like a prophecy. He said, it, his work predicts the world that the digital age brought into being, one where everyone's conscious is saturated all the time with commerce or race or media or drama or tragedy, the slaughter of black bodies, all that is going on in that work. It is the work that no one else could have produced. So we have Jean-Michel Basquiat here. We certainly lost him too soon. So I will end there for now. And I welcome any questions or comments you have. I'm going to start looking at the chat, uh, the Q&A here. One of the first questions I see is um, the writing on the, on the black looks like chalk. Did he do that in paint? Sorry, I don't know exactly which work you're referencing, but um, he used a variety of, of, um, of materials to in order to create his his work. So sometimes he's using like a paint stick, sometimes he's using spray paint, sometimes he's using traditional oil paint. So it could be a, a wide variety of materials he used. Uh, Emily asks in the Q&A, how did Basquiat go from poverty to millionaire status in one year? Who gave him the big break? Um, great question, Emily. Sorry, I didn't make that more clear. It was... Um, Debbie Harry, who bought that first painting, and then he was already uh, sort of on the upward trajectory, but there were several gallerists that helped him out along the way. And um, sort of problematic relationships there into one gallerist in particular gave him a studio space in the basement of her gallery. And he's down there just like cranking the music and cranking out uh, pictures. And one of the sort of unfortunate racist things that came out of that was there was like this chatter in New York City that she had some sort of young black runaway locked in the basement churning out masterpieces. And Basquiat's response to that was like, if I was white, you would have just said artist in residence. So, so there were some um, some really smart gallerists who I who recognized his talent and gave him opportunities early on. So, thank you for for asking about that. Um, Dottie asked, do you think he was holding the saucer in that photo with the artist as a statement that most Black people were in a service role? And in this case, I know which picture you're talking about. I wondered the same question, <laughs> Debbie, Dottie. Um, it, it's it's sort of an unusual pose. Nobody else is holding up a dishware this way. And the look on his face really just sort of seems like he's had it. I, I, I'm not in his head. I, I don't quite know, but 
I got the same, I got a similar impression. Um, Janet asks, why are there so few Basquiat works in museum collections? Where can one see his works? Well, I do know that there is at least one at the Whitney Museum. The reason why they're not in museum collections is because um, while he was alive, museum collections were still rejecting his work. He actually had some early patrons that were huge supporters of his work, and they were trying to give the paintings that they had acquired to works like MoMA and the Whitney, and the, the museums rejected them. And these collectors actually shared stories where they would go to the curators and say, this young man, he's so smart. The curators would say something akin to like, oh, he's street smart. And they would say, no, he's like a genius. Um, he's uh, He suffered from other people's lower expectations, unfortunately. Right after he died, those institutions wanted those paintings in the collections. So only a few of them are in, are in um, museum collections. Even that famous skull painting that uh, was sold for $110 million, it was purchased privately for, I think, $19,000 shortly after it was created. And then nobody saw it for 30 years. All, so many of these works are in private collections, or they belong to the estate of his family. Um, so uh, so, so yeah, uh, they just, they didn't find their way into museum collections before they became astronomically expensive, I think is, is part of the, the issue. They weren't valued by, by curators at the right time. Uh, uh, somebody else asks, oh, uh, near the beginning with the chicken. Okay, that must be going back to the writing on the back. It looks like chalk, did he do it in, in paint? Um, with the specific materials for that work, I'm not sure. Um, it definitely looks like some of this is in chalk, but I believe that this is all paint here. It does, it does look like chalk uh, now that you say that. Um, I, and I'm sorry, I don't have a, a more concrete answer for you, but I, I believe that this is all paint. Uh, um, I, I think I had the credit line for it and I, I believe it's all, all paint. You can see that he's sort of created his own stretcher for his paints back then too, or his paintings, I should say. Um, another question here is from Diane. She says, oh, a comment. The Estate of Basquiat has a prominent website advertising current exhibitions. Thanks for sharing that, Diane. I'm not sure if everybody can see it, but it's basquiat.com. They also have a great presence on Facebook too, if you're interested. And so you can um, become more aware of, of what's happening in terms of the exhibition of those works. There's also some great interviews with his sisters who talk about what it was like to grow up with him. Um, one of the myths that they sort of busted uh, in a video that I've watched is that Basquiat left home and didn't have any connection with his family again. In fact, um, following the reception of one of his first really successful uh, exhibitions, uh, he he showed up at his, at his parents' house in a limo at like seven o'clock in the morning and he said, Papa, I made it. <laughs> so, so, so those, those relationships were sustained um, during his, during his success, during his twenties. And Layla says, who gets the money from the sale of his paintings after his death? Well, it would be the people that, that initially bought, bought it um, or the estate of those people. So, um, so it was an art collector, I'm not even sure if he's alive today, who had initially bought it for $19,000. And then I think it was like uh, a tech billionaire from, from China who ended up purchasing uh, the skull painting for over $110 million. The art market is a fascinating thing, isn't it? <laughs> Louis, the, uh, uh, Louis asks, wow, all of his works in only 27 years. I have the same sense of admiration. There are about 2000 works that are attributed to him. And what's even more amazing is that we know that he would reuse his canvases again and again. So something like that skull painting, I'm sorry to keep going back to it, the untitled work that's so famous. I think one of the most fascinating things about it is that you can see it almost the suggestion that there's like five paintings underneath it. Here you can see some of the text that he's already painted out. Um, I When um, our Art historian wrote about how the mouth there almost looks like you're going into a tunnel. There's so much depth to this two-dimensional painting. So there's 2,000 paintings out there, but underneath the paintings that we have, I mean, there's there's just fascinating levels of detail there too. I'm going to start looking at the chat now too, just to make sure I haven't missed any questions. Um, let's see here. Oh, somebody says the minute you made the analogy to jazz, Basquiat's work suddenly made sense to me. Thanks for sharing that. Um, 
Uh, let's see here. Janine says, the thing to remember about Basquiat's work and the other contemporary work like it is that the art makes you think and stand in front of it for more than 10 seconds to see whether or not you like it or not. Um, great comment, Janine. It wasn't created for you to like it. It was created to convey a message about what the artist was feeling or seeing or hearing. Basquiat is probably one of the best post-impressionist artists to do this. Once when he was asked about his work and what it meant, he replied, I never know how to describe it. It's like asking Miles, how do you, how does your horn sound? Fair point. Oh, thanks. For, thanks so much for sharing that, Janine. That's like, that adds another dimension of it to, to for me. So I appreciate that. Um, the MFA in Boston had Writing the Future a couple of years ago. It was excellent. Um, uh, it was on the same, it was on at the same time as the Monet exhibit. I think a lot of people probably on today got a chance to see that, that MFA exhibit. I understand they turned the basement of the MFA into like a subway station with, with like graffiti in it. Um, thanks for the kind words I'm seeing in the chat. I really appreciate it. And let's just see, what was his relationship to his family as he became famous? Oh, I think I might've touched on that. He's, he maintained relationships with his siblings, certainly. Um, it seems like his relationship with his father was always a little bit troubled, but there are, are, there are great pictures that you can see online too of him celebrating his successes with his parents. Um, so, so those relationships were sustained. Um, Dory says, thanks, this was fascinating. Um, you like learning more about the contemporary artists. Uh, that's great to hear. We're gonna be doing Jackson Pollock in, um, in September. Uh, his nine foot tall painting looks like a jukebox with people dancing around it. Oh, Joseph, I love that interpretation. That was that painting Glenn that we looked at. Where did it go? There it is, a jukebox with people dancing around it. That's so great. Um, and then let's see. Oh, and people are saying I would have walked right past these works, but now they have interest in it. Um, thank you so much. I think we got through all of the questions, Robert. I think so, Jane. So Jane, um, a wonderful job as always. Uh, so uh, folks, um, let's give Jane a big virtual round of applause. And if you haven't already, uh, feel free to leave a positive comment for Jane in the chat. Um, so next Thursday, February 9th, 1030, we're having a presentation on Van Gogh. So we're going sort of from modern back to classic. And uh, on the 16th, uh, on Thursday, the 16th at 1030, we're looking at the art created during the reign of Elizabeth I. Okay. And then at the 23rd, on Thursday, the 23rd, uh, there'll be no uh, morning session. I will be on vacation, but I did partner with the Cary Library in Lexington. And on Thursday, the 23rd at seven o'clock at night, we're doing a talk on the history of black artists in America. So I have a feeling that uh, we may be, sees, may be seeing these paintings again uh, <laughs> for a portion of that program. And then finally, Thursday, March 2nd, so uh, uh, four weeks from today, um, Jane will be back with us, and she'll be talking about uh, Mary uh, Cassatt. How'd I do, Jane? Perfect. <laughs> All right, so she'll be talking about the the, the life and works of uh, Mary Cassatt, so uh, that's going to be Thursday, March 2nd, 1030, and none of this can be possible without the Friends of the Library and the Tewksbury Cultural Council, so we thank them so much. Uh, look for an email from me later today uh, with a feedback survey and with this recording. Uh, and with all that said, Jane, do you have any last words? No, just thank you again, everybody, for, for spending the time with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much, Jane, and we'll see you in four weeks. Sounds great. Take care, right, everybody. Have a good one. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye-bye.